Hi, this is Marcy Casterline again with more movie therapy. And this is the second video about my husband. Uh, the first one was his hero narrative, and that was about uh, Ra The Razor's Edge, and, and that's posted as well. But this is his dark side. And this explains some things that I really wasn't able to figure out about what his inner monologue, what his narrative was, of what he was doing with his life. So here goes. This, this is about the movie Nightmare Alley, Tom's Dark Side. And this is more movie therapy. I'm just starting with my own life, just to be honest and forthright. And I'm going to get to myself in the next couple of ones here. I don't know how enlightening it will be, because I don't know how well I understand myself. But anyway, anyway, I'm old, so what do I have to lose in talking about these things? I watched the more recent version of Nightmare Alley with Bradley Cooper, who is very talented, but I just couldn't sit through it. Cooper just seemed hopelessly miscast, and the director spent a ton of money on set decoration. I mean, the sets were just so full of everything, but it didn't seem like he knew what the movie was about. So I, I couldn't sit through it. But the first one, the one with Tyrone Power, is quite, you, you, if you watch it, if you're into that kind of thing, you will, you will get a lot out of it. But, you know, you have to love dark melodrama. I really don't recommend this movie unless you, you know, for pleasure. It's, it's an interesting movie. It's an interesting experience. But it is a little depressing. That Tyrone Power was determined to get it made with the help of equally determined director Edmund Goulding is quite an achievement due to its frank and disturbing subject matter. But it's considered by many critics to be Edmund Goulding's masterpiece, and he was quite a well-respected director. Interestingly, he also directed The Razor's Edge. After studying The Razor's Edge and finding so much there that provided a very revealing story and many helpful insights of what my late husband's to explain my late husband's self-destructive behaviors, I was very curious to see if Nightmare Alley might shed on more of shed some lights on my marital mysteries, and I wasn't disappointed. As you can see from my video on Razor's Edge, the hero's endless searching for answers seemed to be merely a way to avoid facing life. Tom saw himself as the same kind of misunderstood hero as Larry Darrell. It must have been a very comforting narrative to explain away his strange and constantly self-defeating behaviors. What I still couldn't understand about my husband's cheating problem was why he always sought out women at his jobs as romantic partners and for advice and help. Why would he do this when he had a wife who was just as educated, a success in the same business, just as attractive, and very much more in love with him, and always ready to help him in every way? What was he looking for that he couldn't find at home? What power of fascination did these women have for him? I, I just couldn't follow the emotional logic of these involvements. And every way I looked at it, it made no sense. Couldn't he see that his behavior was sinking his career hopes, as well as being a constant threat to our marriage? What had really gotten my attention about the movie Nightmare Alley were the descriptions of the Helen Walker character, who plays a manipulating quack psychologist, whose power over Stan, the Tyrone Power character, eventually destroys him totally. Hmm, I thought. Something about that sounds familiar. This movie turned out to be the actual sad truth of Tom's real emotional story, not his self-justifying story, as in The Razor's Edge. The Nightmare Alley story begins at a carnival, where Tyrone Power's character, Stan, is an ambitious young man working the sideshow crowd for Zena, the mind reader, and her husband, who is now an alcoholic, most likely due to her constant playing around with other men, and she's probably playing around with Stan, too. The carnival has a geek attraction, and this fascinates Stan. The word geek did not mean then what it means today. This geek is described as the missing link. Is he man or is he beast? His act is biting the head off a live chicken, horrifying the spectators. This act is one of their biggest draws at the carnival. His pay is a bottle of booze a day. Stan cannot understand how anyone can sink as low as the geek. Molly, a pretty young carnival performer, is attracted to Stan. 
She tells him how Zena, the older but still attractive tarot card reading wife of her washed up alcoholic husband, used to be a very successful team who did a mentalist act using a code that's worth its weight in gold. The code allows the assistant to go into the audience and use words and voice to convey information to the blindfolded mentalist on stage. One night, Zena's alcoholic husband Pete is out late searching for more liquor and is desperate. He encounters Stan, who has just bought a bottle, his first bottle of bootleg booze. Stan hides the booze from Pete because Zena doesn't want him to drink, but Pete's condition is so pitiful that Stan finally gives in and retrieves what he thinks is the bottle of booze that he just bought. In fact, it is the bottle of wood alcohol that is used in Zena's act, and it poisons and kills Pete. But before he dies, <clears throat> but before he dies, he dazzles Stan, taking him in completely with his old spiel and shows him how easy it is to emotionally manipulate people. Stan is fascinated. Once Pete passes away, Stan realizes at once that he has accidentally killed Pete, but he doesn't confess. However, this is also his big chance to get Zena to show him the code, because she is now free and they can do the act together. Molly helps in the teaching, and then she and Stan spend the night together. Her weightlifter protector forces him to marry Molly and makes them leave the carnival. At first, Stan is upset that he has to marry Molly, and Molly feels guilty about ruining his life. But then Stan realizes that he has the code and a much younger, more devoted assistant than Zena would ever have been. The team is very successful. Stan has the sophistication and charm to carry it off and fascinate their audiences. In reality, it's not just the code that makes for their success. Molly is an attractive, assist an attractive assistant, and Stan is a very shrewd reader of the characters who make up his audiences. He is also very cynical about life and people. Enter Helen Walker, the scheming quack psychologist, who is key to understanding what this story is really about. She attends one of Stan's performances and tries to trip him up and fails. She's impressed and determined to learn his secret. She summons Stan to her psychology office to wheedle him into showing her how he does his tricks. He laughs and says it wasn't a trick. He says he just looked at her and figured she was trying to make a chump out of him. He pretends to leave her office, but stays behind and discovers that she is secretly recording her patient's sessions and their innermost secrets. She viciously berates him for sneaking around. He confronts her, saying, Takes one to no one. That was my aha moment. Both Stan and Lilith, the Helen Walker character psychologist, are cynical con artists. It began to dawn on me that in my marriage, I was Molly, the innocent, naive person who believed in Tom, but never sincerely believed, but he never sincerely believed in himself. Just like Stan. However, Stan has real talent at performing. His charm and ease at captivating people and making good guesses about their lives has won him an offer to hit the big time in New York. And just like my late husband's self-defeating behavior, Stan turns down this great opportunity in favor of taking cynical Lilith Helen Walker as his partner and using her patient's recordings to con and bilk the local rich folk. Their plan is to use private insider knowledge to fleece their marks by making them think he's genuinely in touch with their dead loved ones. Takes one to know one. He's given a wad of cash by one of these wealthy, grieving clients because he trusts the Lilith, Lilith Helen character, the psychologist, as a fellow conspirator. He gives her all the $150,000 in cash to keep in her safe. Then his former friends from the carnival, where he learned the code, come to visit. They have forgiven all and are happy for his and Molly's success. He, however, is guilt-stricken about accidentally killing Zena's husband. Of course, he's never told Molly, his wife, his terrible secret, for fear of losing her and her love and devotion. 
After they leave, Stan is beset by paralyzing superstitious fears and haunted by guilt about killing Zena's husband. In desperation, there is no one else he can go to but his partner in crime, the quack shrink. So he seeks her out and confesses all. She talks him out of it, and they hatch a scheme to have Molly dress up as a ghost to bilk one of his rich clients. Molly is appalled and is only convinced to go through with it because she loves Stan. But when their victim falls on his knees, cries, and begs his former lover's ghost for forgiveness, Molly can't go through with it, and she exposes the hoax. Stan knows he has to get out of town, ASAP, and hide until it blows over. He goes to Lilith, the the quack psychologist, his partner, but she only gives him $150, not the $150,000. And she acts like he's crazy to think that they were partners. She calls the police and then denies hearing the approaching sirens. She threatens him with the tapes of his confession about Zena's husband's death and tells him she'll have him locked up in a psych ward because he's just another one of her crazy patients. She knows very well they were both in on the con, but she completely destroys him and his mind. Stan utterly falls apart. He's not even sure if she was his partner or what's going on, and he only finally escapes moments ahead of the police by going out her window. He sends Molly back to the carnival in a very sweet way, giving her the $150, and then he goes on the lam, eventually becoming a drunken bum and begging for a job as a geek, the creature more beast than man, at his own carnival. They don't even recognize him except for Molly. Stan becomes a geek, his worst fear. A geek is not even recognizably human. Turns out, for some reason, the Helen Walker quack psychologist had the power to destroy Stan's identity, till all that's left is a hungry, beast-like libido that needs booze to survive. Is this what Tom's alcoholic teenage mother did to him? Did he trust her and she double-crossed him again and again in their relationship when he was a child and needed her most? It probably seems that I'm obsessed with understanding Tom, but don't forget, I lived with him intimately for over 35 years, and every day he lied to me about what was in his mind. What he told me about what he was thinking and feeling was not even close to what was was going on with him, and he never confessed anything. He was always manipulating. You may be thinking, why is all this important? Well, these stories helped me to understand the hidden motives in my husband's life. Dissecting Tom's story with the help of other similar stories that have stood the test of time helps me to understand Tom as well. And, you know, once you can understand someone, it makes it a lot easier to forgive them. It isn't easy to forgive someone for doing that, but working on it and working through what was going on day by day, it has helped me a lot. And I have learned a lot about myself and why it was so easy for Tom to lie to me. I can now see that to pull off his deceptions, Tom took advantage of some of my best traits. I'm a very independent, very logical and honest person. I am also very sympathetic, actually so sympathetic, that I was a very easy sell for Tom's lies and evasions. I was very gullible and Tom took every advantage of that. I really was a prized chump to the point of utter foolishness. I do remember that many people tried to drop hints to me, but I always believed Tom, and I believed in Tom. This should be a lesson to me, not to be such a pushover. It would have been better for both of us if I'd stood up for myself and been less sympathetic and less forgiving and less, okay, well, I understand, and... And I was gullible. I just bought the whole shebang. But why? Why would he choose to live like that? The Helen Walker con artist psychologist is a big clue to something bent in Tom's mind. Their shared cynicism about success being a con, a fake. Having witnessed Tom for a year as he fought a mortal illness just and died finally, I saw how completely out of touch he was with his feelings and probably always had been. He never cried for himself. 
He never said he was sorry to be leaving me and our son. He hardly seemed aware that he was dying. If you can't trust your feelings because you don't feel them, then everything does seem like a con, a fake. You can't tell the real from the faked feelings. In order to survive his violent, disordered childhood, Tom had to completely control his feelings. They were stuffed down into his unconscious, never to reappear in this world again. As I said at the beginning, what has always puzzled me most is why Tom sought out and romanced and trusted so completely some of the women he worked with, women who he barely knew, who never helped his career or remained romantically involved with him. What I think now is that these women were probably unwitting players in Tom's cynical view of success. Whether they shared his cynicism or not is not important, but they were the keepers of his secret guilt, and they could destroy him. I was the keeper of his innocence, which was actually sort of a lie, but I could neither make him happy nor destroy him. I was not in on the secret hell he lived in. It's been easier to forgive Tom and myself now that I understand his story better. It's been very reassuring to see these movies where others are involved in a story that is so much like mine. Movie therapy has helped me immensely. And I'm hoping it will help you too. I'm doing these videos in the hope that talking about these things may get you thinking about the movies that you see and, and what they make you feel and how they what they tell you about yourself. Try it. It's kind of fun, really. Like solving a mystery novel by watching the people go through things that arouse your feelings and seeing what that tells you. And you can do it all by yourself in private. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. I hope you enjoy this. Oh, and don't forget, read my book, Be Deviled, if you want the uh, whole story of uh, Tom and myself and how all this happened. And and it tells a little bit about my psychic experiences, too. I did not start out, I started out as a scientist, extremely skeptical of psychic things. And, you know, the, the spirit world and... God, and God kept beating me over the head until I accepted the psychic world. And you'll see all the things that happened. That I kept thinking, oh, no, I couldn't. it's not this, it's not that. It, you know. Yeah, okay. I was a doubting Thomas. Thank you very much.